So the second part of the session will be, as far as I know, and I think this is correct, talks with Gentry data. So these are all talks that uh, are from the project. And we have Marta Lasku that will start uh, with comparative demography of seven tree species. OK. Uh, so I'm going to present what is basically a work we did in one of the work package, the so-called work package four. It's extremely preliminary results, so bear in mind this is not the final word, but I'll try to explain what was the goal of what we did and what we have done, achieved so far. So again, the goal in uh, this work package was to create a genetic diversity map for seven key European forest uh, tree species. So th that will be, in essence, the first uh, multi-species map since the site of our project, uh, which was uh, coordinated by somebody from INRAE, uh, Rémi Petit. So second goal was to associate genetic variation to environmental variable, infer past population transfer and demography, and use a multi-scale sampling scheme to infer spatial scale of gene flow and local adaptation, and identify alleles under local adaptation. So to do that, we have seven species, so Populus nigra, Petula pendula, Quercus petrea, Fagus sylvatica, Pisa abies, Pinus pinaster, and Pinus sylvestris. So four broad leaves and three conifers. For the sampling, because again, we were interested in looking at adaptive variation, we choose a, a sampling in pairs, uh, following a work of uh, Cathy Loiteros and Michael Whitlock, which showed that basically, if you want to find FST outliers, the best is to take pairs of populations which are close enough to be gene linked by gene flow, yet in different ecological niche or under a different selection uh, pressure. So basically, that's the design we have adopted. So in connection with another work package, work package three, so we put in place uh, 170 populations, so that co correspond to uh, 5,000 trees. So it includes the seven species plus uh, some outgroups. So for instance, in PCR, it doesn't make any sense to work on PCR-ABS without PCR obovata in, uh, in uh, uh, birch. It might be important to also have uh, close relatives. So we have added that. So the cross here, uh, like for instance, this one is a pair of populations, say in Sweden. So these are the seven species for the colors. And the uh, stars are species which were added later on to the basic design. So they are not necessarily in pairs. They usually are not. OK, to do the sequencing, we use exome capture design. So and, uh, that's the uh, capture targets in the seven species. And how much was uh, sequence, uh, uh, capture uh, space, so basically uh, 3 million uh, best pair in, in all cases. So the workflow was first to define uh, target genes. Uh, and there we have tried to have uh, genes, uh, autologs, uh, of interest across the seven species. So not all genes were of that nature. Some, in some species, people wanted to work on a specific gene, which was not of interest in others. So it's not totally overlapping, but there is some overlap across the seven species. Then the probe design was done by Roche. Library preparation and sequencing was done by IGATS. Uh, quality trimming was done by uh, joint uh, groups across uh, the project, as well as SNP calling. And we use two approaches for a de novo approach, and which is completed, 
and a reference approach where we use a, a, a reference genome to, to map uh, do, during the mapping. So, uh, so two, two different approaches. Uh, and here the results are based only on this uh, first approach. So again, to, the NOVA assembly was done by GATS, so 20, 20 uh, different samples assembled using CLC genomic uh, workbench, and the SNP calling uh, performed on selected contigs, so showing 95% similarity when we are in the target region and at least eight reads, and a mean coverage of more or less than eight in at least 50% samples for the off-target uh, sequences. And so here is the number of SNP obtained in the, of raw SNP, uh, so that is before filtering, before quality test, obtained across the seven species. So basically from uh, half a million to 3.5 million. The number of SNP we obtain after filtering for quality and paralogs. And so the number, say, using across the different species varies from 127,000 in Populus nigra to 372,000 in, uh, in Pinus uh, pinaster. Okay, so as I said, the last major effort, ma uh, mapping of genetic diversity effort uh, done in Europe was in the site of our project. So that was a project based only on chloroplast DNA. And the paradigm at the time, what we were interested to do in this um, project is to see whether or not there were some common patterns across the, the, the species we used in recolonization route after the last glacial. And the paradigm was you have three refugia, one in Spain, one in Italy, and one in the Balkans. And after the last ice age, that three refugia recognized Europe. We did find this to be the case in this type of species, but for instance, in Populus uh, tremula or in uh, Betula pandula, you don't find that at all. So here is an example from uh, Betula pandula. So if you had looked at oaks, you will have uh, the blue here, the red there, and uh, say the yellow there. You don't get that. You get a kind of kind of absence of population structure structure across Europe. Okay? So again, and one explanation is there's not been such a thing as free refugia in the case of Betula, and there was evidence of macrofossils in country much more north than uh, than uh, this uh, this free peninsula in the south uh, during the last glacial. So these trees were able to survive north of these uh, of these uh, regions. So what does the nuclear DNA say? And so using our data across the seven species, what we did, and again, I stress this is extremely preliminary results. What it says is basically the FST, so this is the four uh, broad leaves. So the FST value, not surprisingly, are fairly low. Uh, this one is a bit higher, but it's tend to be between zero and 0. Uh, one, and, but despite of that, in all seven species, there is some sort of structure. Okay, perhaps not in Pinus sylvestris, but for the rest, pretty much, you always find something. So these are PCAs, and so what you see, this is PC1, PC2, and what you see, for instance, here, this is Betula pendula, these are the two Italian populations, and these are the European populations. And so if you look at PC3 and PC4, what you find is usually a north-south gradient of the population. It's not striking, it's not, here is one cluster, here is another, but you do find a trend, okay? And actually, we have independent data which basically end up with similar structure. Here, this is uh, Populus nigra, so this is Bosnia, this is Morocco, this is the rest. And again, if we look at the rest, here is the UK. Again, some evidence of structure. Fagus sylvatica, 
Greece stands out on, on one and two. And then this is Spain, this is Norway. Again, you have, again, the structure. The same in Kirkus Petrea. And if we look at the conifers, so you might remember what Pascal showed this morning. We've done it now with 5,000 trees. I'll show that a bit later. Same story on and on again. Basically, the Alps here, the Serobovata here, the north here, uh, this probably Central Europe, or Caucasian Central Europe, the Carpathian here. So it's really a quite clear structure, and a structure you can explain in terms of population movement after the last ice ages. The same in Pinus Silvestris. So, okay, Pinus Silvestris, Italy stands out. Uh, the rest look like a mess, but I'm quite convinced that eventually we'll still find some sort. It will be weaker, and that's what the FST told, uh, tells us here. We can, but there will be some sort of structure, and here is maritime pine. This is North Africa and the rest. Okay, so all species, with the exception, perhaps, of Pinus silvestris, show an interpretable population genetic structure. Again, think about humans, where we are in humans, what type of map you can make. This is not a surprise. I think with this data, you, you'll find structure. So what are the next step? Well, this is definitely not an analysis. It's just an exploratory data analysis of the data, this PCAs. We cannot interpret that. Or we can, but with some risk. So we'll do model-based demographic inference across the seven species, and it will be important there to try to develop new methods to jointly analyze the species. So gone, this morning has been very dominated by hardcore selectionists for whose only positive selection matters. No, most of the mutations are deleterious. The conifers have gigantic loads, so we we'll try to look at can we relate population demography to the genetic load? Third, association with phenotype and environmental variables. So lots of data have been collected on these trees and on the environment in which we've been uh, growing. So we try to do association of the same type of, of what has been shown already in a previous talk. And finally, I think we should not work in isolation, and we should try to link the data with other data sets. And I'll give two examples. So here, for instance, in Norway spruce, we have a sequence with exome capture. So same technology, but not the same probes. Actually, a much larger number of probes here. 5,000 trees, PCIBS and PCR bovata, representing basically all the base population of the uh, breeding program, Skookforsch breeding program. Since a lot of the trees were actually introduced in Sweden recently, this is a representation of the whole range to which we have added uh, individual collected in natural populations. And so again, you, you get the, the same type of, uh, this is Special Bovata, these are uh, northern population, a bit more southern, Central Europe, uh, the Alps, uh, this is the north. Uh, so you, a very beautiful pattern. And we have also in, in birches, uh, just sequence 480 trees with exactly the same probes as in gene tree. There it's a cline covering most of Sweden. We've also, in this case, trees taken across uh, the natural range of, of the species. And so this is a PCA, it's picture doesn't show very well, but this is for, we included all the uh, birch species growing in Europe. So this is a dwarf birch, this is a white birch, this is the uh, silver birch, this population from East Asia, and this is uh, Spain, which in all analysis, our analysis too, uh, tend to, to cluster outside, uh, outside of the rest of the, the white birches. And so, again, it will be nice in the long run to try to link this data set. I do know that similar data set exists in other species, so there's a lot of opportunities to, to link uh, this data. Finally, 
I would like to stress, as has been done in the previous talks, the importance of population structure, but with a quote which I think is quite nice. With respect to confounding by population structure, when we do these association studies, the key qualitative difference is between controlling the environment experimentally and not doing so, in our case, not doing so. Once we leave an experimental setting, we are effectively skating on thin ice, and whether the ice will all depends on how far we skate. And so, beware of population structure when you do association, even if you have massive uh, data, like in humans. This is actually uh, commenting on two papers in humans, which turn down the conclusion which was drawn previously of selection on height in humans. It's population structure. There's no selection. So uh, this selection matters. And thank you for your attention. Thank you, Martin. Also perfectly keeping the time. <laughs> Questions, Antoine? Martin, for these seven species you had, actually the chloroplast data available, do you think some of the structure may be explained by the history? Or would you? Yeah, the, the population structure is, uh, I mean, with, even without the chloroplast data, it's definitely a story you see. I mean, in a, I didn't come up extensively, but uh, for us in the case of, uh, of spruce, which I know quite well now, what you really see is the three refugia, Carpathians, Alps, and the East, and Obovata, actually. And what you see today is basically recognition from this refugia with admixture zone, basically. Like, for instance, if you take Northern Poland, is a case in point, you see a contribution from the Carpathians and a contribution from the Alps, uh, and also, actually, from, from the East. So free freeway type of uh, of admix, admixture. So so that's why I have a firm belief. I know in some species not going to be as easy as it is in spruce because it's been less structured, geographically less structured. But uh, I think we will see that. But we did that include. Uh, if it, it would have been really nice uh, to have empty DNA, of course. Uh, like in 21st, or some chloroplast probably, we did not have that. Hi, thanks for the talk. Uh, Sean Hoban from the Morton Arboretum. Uh, of course. <laughs> uh, really, really great to see this. Um, I was wondering if you could talk a little more about the demographic modeling. Will you just test the three refuge hypotheses, or can you also test um, further north glacial refuges? And can you even get more specific to the timing uh, and, and rate of expansion of different species? Uh, not at that stage. Definitely not at that stage. As I said, we didn't do any uh, yet any model based. So we would have to run something like ABC or fast sim call uh, and things like that. But timing, you know, do you know the generation time in trees? We don't. So timing will always be, uh, in my understanding, quite questionable. I mean, in, in years. In generation, probably less. But so, no, I can't say. So the aim, of course, I don't know if it's doable, but will be to try to use kind of similar models across the, the seven species, at least the same method, and try to, to see uh, whether we see some common pattern. I don't, I mean, one of the major lessons of a site of our project is that the idea that you had some kind of ecosystem which will evolve just doesn't work. It's species by species. All the species tended to have kind of, uh, it's contingency basically, which matters most uh, to explain the current, uh, current uh, structure. And I mean, one thing we have to keep in mind is uh, in Oaks, I think also it was shown quite beautifully already a long time ago, is uh, species don't evolve in isolation. So we don't know exactly the contribution from PCR Bovata. I can't give you a figure, so perhaps 40% of the genome of the northern trees is of obovata origin. So we're really talking of a very large, uh, like uh, gene flow extending very far west and with a quite large, uh, large impact. 
Hi, my name is Devrim Semizar Cumming. I'm uh, coming from Freiburg, the Forest Research Institute in Germany. Uh, my question, thank you for your presentation, and my question is related to your uh, sampling strategy. I want to, I would like to learn a little bit more about this pair sampling. For example, what, uh, what was the um, uh, shortest and the largest distance in between these population pairs? Thank you. So, okay. So when we designed this project, we basically was endless discussion on what sampling to use. And to cut it short, I propose that, so mea culpa. So I probably will not do it again. Uh, no, what I mean is it's extremely hard if you work on that scale to find pairs of population close enough and yet in different environment, okay? I think the design was inspired by the Rockies in Canada and you were taking some low and some high. It was very nice. Uh, it, it will work in this case here. I think it's, it's a bit more difficult. So, and hopefully it will work for, uh, for the part where we are going to look at FST outliers. But of course, it's a constraint for demographic inferences. Perhaps there I would have preferred to have a different type of sampling. So you can't get the idle sampling for all kinds of situations. You have, but. Do you remember the distances? like? Sorry? What, uh, what, what was your criteria about the distances? Like, for example, five kilometers, is it? Uh, no, 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 it's, uh, there was no fixed criteria. Meters. We could not have one yeah. for all, all species to begin with. And no, there was no such a thing. Okay. So just to answer from some hundred meters to 100 kilometers, something like that, depending on what the contrast is, if it's latitude or altitude or something. Thank you.